the way, again, I'm, I'm getting it. Uh, so it's very, it's getting becoming very popular, just like it was popular to say, because I debunked Russiagate, people wanted to call me a Trump apologist. And because I debunked the gas attacks in Syria, people called me an Assadist. Uh, and now because I'm pushing back against I'm giving a critical examination of the covid narrative coming from the establishment. People are calling me anti-vax, even though I'm double vaxxed. And I say to do exactly what Robert Malone, Dr. Robert Malone says to do with the vaccines, which is you vaccinate the vulnerable. That's what you're supposed to do. You vaccinate the elderly and the vulnerable. You let the virus then spread. It becomes an endemic, meaning it becomes less deadly, but more contagious. According to Robert Malone, the way we are doing it is making everything worse because it's a very leaky vaccine, meaning if you get the vaccine, you can still transmit it and you can still get it. So and it's very leaky. So that means no matter how many people get vaccinated, we're not going to get rid of COVID. We're still going to keep passing it around to everybody, no matter if 100% of the people are vaccinated. And who said that? Joe Biden's COVID response director said that. Andy Slavitt. He said that. So I'm getting even my friends in Hollywood are like, how come Jimmy's being anti-vax? I'm not being, I am not anti-vax. I'm for the correct administration of it. So I want to make the case, I just, and I want to remind people that we are anti-mandate. We are not active vaccine. We are anti-mandate. Why are we anti-mandate? Because on principle, just like Dr. Fauci was against mandates, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, they were all against mandates on principle a year ago, but now nothing has changed to change that principle, but they've all flip-flopped on it. And I want to let other people know what the reason why we are against mandates is because the reason why you get vaccinated is to protect yourself because you can't protect any other people from from the the virus anymore. Why? Because they just finished a year long study and it shows that people who are vaccinated spread the Delta variant. People inoculated against COVID-19 are just as likely to spread the Delta variant of the virus that can tra tracks their health than those who have had the shot, according to new research. So you're just as likely if you have been vaccinated to spread the virus is if you aren't vaccinated, just as likely. That's what the research, a year long research said. Uh, 621 people in the UK with mild COVID scientists found that their peak viral load was similar regardless of vaccination status. The results go away. They explain that the, the variant is so infectious, even in nations with successful vaccine rollouts. And that's why the unvaccinated can't assume that they are protected because others have had the shot. Our findings show that vaccination alone is not enough to prevent people from being infected with the Delta variant. Well, the fact is you can't protect yourself from being infected with it because you're going to be infected with it because it's going not going away. And you can and the vaccines don't protect you from getting the virus. Uh, the ongoing transmission we are seeing between vaccinated people makes it essential for unvaccinated people to get vaccinated to protect who themselves. So you get vaccinated to protect yourself. That's what the science says. But everybody's telling you, you got to get vaccinated to protect other people so we can get to herd immunity. But you cannot do that. You cannot vaccinate enough people. Even if 100 percent of the people are vaccinated, it will not stop this virus because you can still transmit it and get infected from the virus. Even when you're vaccinated, that's what this proves. That's what this study proves. In fact, this is Joe, I showed you this before. This is Joe Biden's director of COVID response saying that everyone will get the virus. Everyone is going to get this virus. That's Joe Biden's director of COVID response telling you that given the contagiousness of the Delta virus and the way it's going to mutate, this means SARS COVID 2 will be contagious enough that everyone will get the virus so this idea that keith oberman has and other people who are close to me think that if we can just get enough people vaccinated we can go back to normal and no one will get it that's not the fact the countries that are going back to normal are living with the virus they've decided to live with it it's going to become endemic meaning everyone's going to get it. So prepare for it. So this idea that the unvaccinated are a threat to you is ridiculous because the vaccinated are just as much a threat to you, according to the science, and you're not going to be able to avoid it. Everyone's going to get this virus. 
People, normal people get the flu virus twice every decade. So this coronavirus isn't going away. And within now or 10 years, you're going to get it. Those, that is the science. And so we're not anti-vax at this show. We are anti-mandate. And who, and by, why? Because the Harvard study shows that the countries and counties with the highest vaccination rates have the highest rates of transmission. So the idea that you can vaccinate your way out of transmitting this virus is an incorrect one. And it's one coming from big pharma and it's not right. And who do you want to, who is against mandates? I just want to let you know why we're against mandates because we're against it on principle. And guess who else was against it on principle? Dr. Fauci. And do you foresee that the vaccine might be mandated for any populations, perhaps for um, school age children? No, I don't think you'll ever see a mandating of vaccine, particularly for the general public. Sometimes in the health sector, like in my hospital here at NIH, uh, you're not going to be allowed to go on the ward unless you get a flu vaccine. But you would never mandate, at least I do not think you would. <laughs> uh, I'd be pretty uh, surprised if you mandated it for any element of the general public. Now, as a primary care physician myself, who's had many conversations around vaccine safety with patients, I'm curious, what what's our contingency plan for people who might refuse the vaccine? Well, I mean, they have every right to refuse vaccine. I don't think you need a contingency plan. If someone refuses the vaccine in the general public, then th there's nothing you can do about that. You cannot force someone to take a vaccine. Right. Who else said that? That's a principle. That's not based on anything. If the science changes, I'll change. But no, that's a principle. Here's Nancy Pelosi saying the same the thing. thing. We, are, we cannot require someone to be vaccinated. That's just not what we can do. It is a matter of privacy to know who is or who isn't. Just something we can't do. Not that, yeah, maybe we can do it if we decide. No, we can't do it. It all changed. Here's Joe Biden. They asked, should, should we have a mandate for the vaccine? They asked him, should no, we have a mandate? I don't think it should be mandatory. I wouldn't demand to be mandatory, but I would do everything in my power. It's like I don't think masks have to be made mandatory nationwide. And guess who else is against the mandates? Black Lives Matter of New York, okay? So again, this people who are caught because they have no nuance around this COVID discussion. None. It's either you'd say do exactly what the establishment says around COVID and the vaccines, or you're an anti-vaxxer. That's the kind of shit I'm getting. And that is anti-intellectual, it's lazy thinking, and it's wrong. And yeah, I've got I've gotten the same exact accusation hurled at me, Jimmy, even though I go out of my way to the point of tedium to just disclose that, yeah, I am personally vaccinated. I made that choice on my own accord, not because I think I'm personally that vulnerable, but because, you know, I didn't want a severe flu like illness. And, you know, there, I thought there could be some benefits for maybe reducing transmission initially. So, but whatever my reasoning, I am vaccinated. And yet. When I've reported or commented on aspects of COVID policy or COVID related policy in a variety of different contexts in a critical manner or a skeptical manner, because more and more they're completely arbitrary at this phase in the COVID cycle when we're in now pretty incontrovertibly an endemic, um, we're dealing with an endemic disease. When you point out some of these arbitrary impositions, whether it's the uh, instatement of kind of capricious uh, surveillance protocols, particularly at elite colleges, which are kind of the breeding grounds for the governing ideology that's soon going to be taking over the rest of the country, or uh, you know, service workers being forced to wear masks in proximity to you know, dignitaries or whatever. I mean, wh whatever, the, whatever the precise subject is that involves COVID, if you take a critical slant toward it, or if you're skeptical of some of the underlying fallacious premises, automatically you get cast as some kind of horribly nefarious anti-vaxxer. And it doesn't matter how many times you clarify that you are personally vaccinated. And as I do, and I advocate that people get vaccinated if they feel like it's in their best health interest. I don't know how that's an anti-vax position, but that's that's the smear that you get yes. you know, tarnished with you know, if you just depart slightly from the narrative that gets churned uh, uh, you know, 24 seven on CNN and whatever. Right, and then and, and the people who say that, even my close, close friends, 
who say things about COVID are getting their information from fucking CNN. They're yeah. not they're not doing any investigation. They're not questioning anything they hear from Fauci or the fucking CNN or the Washington Post, even though they've been caught lying time and time and time again about this. And Fauci has no answers to why people who have natural immunity from having had covid, why they need to be vaccinated. He doesn't have an answer for that. So that, that so just asking obvious questions now gets you labeled an anti-vaxxer. So it's. <laughs> It's going to happen again. So I'm just going to. And, and it's, it's the reason it's ominous to me, especially, is because if you don't challenge some of these premises of the predominant COVID narrative, what you're doing is exactly what's happened, or what you're kind of enabling is exactly what's happened to the friends that you allude to. They get habituated into a mindset which treats COVID as a permanent crisis, uh, as a crisis that needs constant emergency measures to yes. curtail yes. and which then gives license to people in positions of power, whether it's administrative power at a place like an elite college or governmental power or corporate power. It gives people who wield that power license to never relinquish the, the powers that they were supposed to have been temporarily granted to deal with the onset of an emergency situation. Well, guess what? People, once they wield power, aren't generally inclined to give them up without a fight. And, you know, when you just kind of mindlessly accept what's being funneled out on these mainstream outlets regarding uh, COVID in a variety of different ways, what you do is kind of create an atmosphere that is excessively tolerant of the acquisition on a permanent basis of pretty extraordinary powers. Like I've been, co- I, for a while, you know, in, in September and into October, I was covering these um, kind, of, kind of quasi-lockdown measures at elite colleges, not because I cared particularly about, you know, the living arrangements of, you know, liberal arts students or whatever, um, you know, whose parents were funding them to get elite educations, but because the kind of, the, the mentality that is inculcated at those institutions is going to become the dominant governing kind of ideology or ethos at other institutions once those once those students graduate, right? And so therefore it's worthy of, of scrutiny. And uh, you know, they they were basically they basically have a system now at so many of these colleges and I would get I've gotten was flooded with anonymous reports from people who go to major, you know, reputable law schools and, and undergraduate institutions who were petrified that if they went on the record or if I revealed their identity in their their reports as to what the dynamics are on their campuses, it would be hell for them and they would lose all kinds of career prospects. They would be socially ostracized. They could even be disciplined. And in the case of law students, for example, they could be, you know, have complaints registered against them and it would be harder to find a job. So they can't, go on the record about these snitching systems that have been set up at these elite colleges where if you walk around inside and your mask is temporarily lowered or you take a sip of water while you're sitting in, a, in an hour and a half lecture, that's a big violation. And the administrators encourage students to snitch on each other. And so you get docked on your disciplinary record for, for violating that COVID rule. And again, why, why is that significant? Why does that matter if you're not attending one of these colleges? Well, because that's the same sort of approach, which is going to get institutionalized elsewhere if it's not challenged and if its underlying premises aren't rebutted. So that's, I think, an important thing to do because otherwise we're kind of tacitly allowing the construction of this uh, permanent or semi-permanent kind of uh, biosurveillance apparatus, which I think is really, uh, really dangerous in terms of civil liberties, whatever wherever you happen to be in society. I mean, it's kind of corrodes one sense of privacy, whether it's medical privacy or freedom to move, freedom to, to um, congregate. And, you know, you, the, it, it's one thing to accept, have accepted that on a temporary basis with caveats initially before anything was really known about the effects of COVID. But now it's long past time that there should be any any acceptance of a lot of uh, these measures, particularly because even on a scientific level, they don't hold up to scrutiny, but they do enable these new, you know, kind of power hungry bureaucrats to lord over their subjects and feel very important 
about themselves for having the ability to kind of monitor like what is, is, is this college student meeting with friends illicitly at a, oh my gosh, an indoor restaurant. And therefore that's supposedly an outbreak, causes an outbreak. And we have to, you know, uh, run around with our hair, hair on fire, even though it makes no epidemiological sense. Um, you know, I think tacitly allowing that stuff to continue without challenge is really a foreboding omen for the rest of the country. Um, and, you know, it, ha- it does have to be rebutted and it's not anti-vax. It's not conspiracy theory. Uh, it's not kind of, you know, you know, right wing nihilism a, or something. Yeah. It's responding to actual events and, and requesting that people who possess power to govern society just deploy those powers in a sensible way or at the very least relinquish them, um, which they should do at this point and should have done so actually a long time ago. Uh, I think that's well said. Yes. Uh, you know, just just to what we're doing to children, right? Like people don't want kids to go to school <laughs> and kids are at no risk from COVID K- kids risks of having serious I- illness from COVID is so low. It's immeasurable. They have it's less than the seasonal flu. It's it's great. Yes. I want to let you know, in November 6th, we're going to be in Baltimore, November 11th. 